Beyond the basic information asymmetry obstacles, extensively stamped in recent years, there are some mechanisms, still hardly verifiable, that could generate distortion in the information flows, mostly towards weaker parties. Cognitive biases are frequently exploited in order to bypass best practices. The way information is provided to shareholders, the way of developing some KPIs, the emphasis of some data rather than other. It's not by chance that cherry picking, premium effect, apophenia, or base rate fallacy are catching on companies. Hi there, welcome to Consider. Today's video is about corporate governance, a topic that's closer to my heart. I know you may be thinking, wow, what a fun and exciting topic, I can't wait to learn more. But bear with me, because corporate governance is pretty important. Before we start, I want to remind you that all the information discussed here and in our other videos is supported by trusted bibliography, sources and papers. Corporate governance matters because it ensures that the people running a company benefit everyone involved, not just themselves. It's especially important when a company has shareholders because their interests can often clash with those running the company. Corporate governance manages those conflicts and ensures that everyone is playing nice. Now, there are various models of corporate governance out there that vary depending on where you are in the world. Indeed, what's interesting is that many of these models are based on different behavioral and cultural factors. In addition to the company structure, obviously. Let's take a look at the the two most common models, monistic and dualistic models. The monistic model is where you have a single board of directors made up of both inside directors who run the company daily and outside directors who keep an eye on things to ensure everything is above board. This model focuses on the interest of shareholders. The dualistic model, on the other hand, a supervisory board made up of non-executives overseeing the executive board, which consists of day-to-day -day managers. This model is more common in some jurisdictions and often associated with more traditional companies. For example, a company that adopts the monistic model, but has a CEO who is also the chairman of the board and who owns a significant portion of the company's share, may prioritize their interest over those of other shareholders and even use their power to suppress dissent and maintain control. A company that adopts that dualistic model may be a better keep to prevent the conflicts of interest with the supervisory board elected by the general meeting responsible for monitoring the executive board. Anyway, there are other models of corporate governance like the family-owned model, the state-owned model, the French PDG, and so on. But let me draw your attention to the Nordic model, which is all about non-executives. In this model, the board of directors is made up entirely of non-executives who are responsible for appointing the executive management. Employee representatives are also appointed by employee organizations, balancing the interest of different stakeholders. It's important to note that there is no one-size-fits-all answer when it comes to the best corporate governance model for a particular company and stakeholder involved. That's why it's so important to have good corporate governance to ensure that everyone is working together in a way that benefits everyone. Corporate governance is a short blanket and we need to constantly update and adjust it to make sure it's working as well as it can. There will always be challenges when it comes to corporate governance, but we have things like the Corporate Governance Code and the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act to help regulate and manage these issues. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and visit our website at concisos.com to read a complete article about models of corporate governance. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.